Now, you know, if we're going to call this an introduction to Zen, no emptiness, no holiness, just emptiness has to be point number one. Waco comes, and he comes to this mountain temple, and apparently the cave was included in the grounds. We can only surmise this because all the mountain temples had had they, they looked like old army forts, like the, you know the cavalry had in Indian country. They all had a stockade around them, and this is because in China bandits bandit was like a trade. What do you want your son to grow up to be? A bandit, <laughs> you know. I mean, and bandits roam back and forth between provinces, and they they attack villages, and they go back to their province, and and um, it was not a real good thing. The Chinese can be pretty brutal. Uh, it was not uncommon for you know slaughter to take place. Remember, and so um, all the temples had a gate they closed, and they always closed it at night. They locked the gate at night. Uh, during the daytime, it could be standing open. But these mountain temples didn't have a lot of visitors. They might have pilgrims, but they were so far away from villages by this time, uh, and they were getting what they were trying to do is get away from the influence of the court, and truly develop this Buddhist practice where it wasn't constantly uh, vying with other religions. Because there was, the history of religion in China is a history of three religions. And those three religions always wanted to have a little favor. In other words, if you wanted to build a temple in a village because there was no temple, they had to say it was okay to build a temple. But the Taoists might say, wait a minute, you're letting them build too many temples. And if the Taoist advisor to the emperor had influence, then they didn't get to build it. So politics, almost from the beginning, existed in China with Buddhism. And um, this moving out in the country was a, a definite mark of moving away from the center of politics and trying to get back to a, a clean practice. And so Bodhidharma is sitting up there behind a stockade, although he's not behind a stockade. He's you know, in an area of the compound where there's a little cave and he's facing a wall. And we're told that he just basically didn't move. And he probably didn't any more than the Buddha did. You know, we know the Buddha got up and went, relieved himself, and the Buddha got up and went and washed his face. But his primary practice was meditation. Now, this was a senior monk. This is a, a monk that everybody feels probably uh, was enlightened, but maybe he wasn't. Because we have a famous quote from Bodhidharma. Seven times I tried and failed, the eighth time I made it. And he's talking about the number of years he sat facing the wall. And if that was a, if that's truly a quote from him, it means he was trying to make the final breakthrough. And he finally made the final breakthrough. Well, about a year later, here comes this guy, Wei Ko. And he's a monk. And he comes to the temple because he'd heard about this just extraordinary meditation master. And um, he bangs on the door, and the monks come out and say, it's too late, you can't come in, we don't open the gate this time of night. It's snowing, by the way, which it does in China. And so he stands out in the snow all night, and then the next day he bangs on the gate, and the guy goes, you look like a bandit to me, go away. And this goes on for a number of days. And he keeps repeating that he wants to go see the great Indian master, Bodhidharma. And um, finally, they just told him, you know, get out of here. We don't know you. Uh, come back in the spring. Uh, we're not going to open this gate. And, of course, if you think about it, they probably, you know, they're living off of stored food. You know, it's, it's not a real time, nice time of the year. They were probably a little nervous about it. Everybody stayed inside. And uh, we're told that he takes out a sword now. Where did he get the sword? I don't know. He takes out a sword and he cuts off his arm. Pretty extreme gesture. And he says, I bring this offering to the great master Bodhidharma. So the monk, guard, monk or monks guarding the gate open the gate and let him in. He goes to Bodhidharma. He stands before him with a dripping bloody stump he says to Bodhidharma after I've come to study with you and after he stands there for a long time and Bodhidharma ignores him and Bodhidharma says finally well who are you he says I'm Waco I've come to learn your meditation I've come for your advice Bodhidharma looks at him and says well you seem to have a certain amount of dedication 
<laughs> bloody stump. So he says, um, ask your question. And Waco says, I'm very good at meditation. I've been meditating many years. But no matter how hard I meditate, I can do many different forms of meditation. I cannot still my mind. The mind always seems to be on the move. And Bodhidharma said to him, Well, show me this mind. And Waco, now this is a guy that just cut his arm off, so this guy's not playing games. He stood there for a long time trying to figure out how to show Bodhidharma his mind. And finally he said, Master, I can't do it. I can't find my mind. And Bodhidharma said, See, it's still. And Waco, at that instant, became the second patriarch. And of course, he continued to stay with Bodhidharma until Bodhidharma returned 30 years later to India. And Waco, his gift to us is that persistence. It's that vigor that we were talking about. In order to practice Zen and become awake, you have to be willing to throw everything away. Okay? He didn't bleed to death? No. Well, you know, he didn't bleed to death. Yeah. Well, it's interesting, you know, for years I was a first aid instructor for the Red Cross, one of the many volunteers. And um, one of the controversies, ever since I was a little kid, uh, was... Uh, about the tourniquets, because I was a Boy Scout, and the thing I loved, uh, the troop I belonged in as a kid, they took the older kids and they had them teach the different areas, you know, the kids had to do, and I loved first aid. I just loved first aid, so I always, a couple of us got to teach first aid to the new kids, and um, you very seldom need a tourniquet with an amputation, because it's when it's a real amputation, what usually happens is the blood vessels spasm and close up. Your body can take better care of it than you give it credit for. Where you need tourniquets is where you get big gashes, you know, where you you get cut deeply. And you haven't lost a limb. But for some reason, when the body, even if it's a finger or it's a foot or, you know, which is a horrible thing to have happen, but it tends to cut it off. But no, we have no... And, and I could see him reaching down and grabbing a sash and kind of wrapping it around the stump. But um, he gives us that kind of persistence. And that persistence is not about, very often gets confused with material things. It's not about material things. Uh, the mere action that he did, it's not, not that he was standing in the snow with simply the belongings he had on him. The thing was, he was willing to injure himself. Not that anybody should do that. But it's an extreme thing. And, and many people argue that it's just an apocryphal story and it didn't really happen. And I've read it one time. Uh, so, and I think somebody who didn't agree with that wrote the story that what happened was he was trying to get in the gate and they were closing it and they broke his arm. And so then he went to, but see, that's Western sensibilities. Chinese can be real brutal. And I used to think that, oh, well, it's just a story. And then you, you find out that, you know, Chinese generals at the end of World War II, um, you know, the two sides, the communists and the republic were fighting either side. When they won a battle, they would go in and decapitate everybody in the town that resisted. Just like Genghis Khan. And then you start thinking, well, maybe this isn't that totally extreme. Particularly for a primitive time. That someone that was that uh, driven to truly waken up would be willing to sacrifice a limb. Okay? I don't know. But it gets everybody thinking when... When I tell that story, but it's it's that persistence. You know, we've been talking about the perfections. That is the vigor. That is the vigor that has to keep happening there. That you don't give up. That you don't and and that you don't get discouraged. People think that a religious practice should always be revitalizing. See, that's what the Taoist idea was. If I go do uh, Tai Chi. If I do some special breathing exercise, if I do a period of meditation, I'll be revitalized. And the reality of, of it is, you will be. To do a half an hour, even an hour of meditation on a Sunday, will revitalize you. Because it, you stop that mind that Waco wanted to stop. 
And when you come back and that mind gets busy again, it's very, very fresh. So uh, that's a kind of revitalization. Colors are brighter, smells are sharper. Um, it's, it's as if you're seeing them for the first time. The problem with a meditation retreat is that when you do hours and hours and hours and hours and hours, you're doing a demanding activity. You're sitting up straight. You're not giving in to every little whim. You know, you're not uh, wandering off to the refrigerator to get a carrot when you feel like a snack. Um, you're, very often you're in an uncomfortable situation, not what people would usually think of. But you just don't have those little comforts. You can't sit down in your easy chair. You can't click the television on or you can't, you know. You are in a foreign place. Even though it's your temple, you kind of got to be careful. It's like having guests all the time. And to do two or three days of that is to get tired. There's, you know, there's different kinds of tires. I used to take the greatest nap in the world when I'd get home from a retreat. Get up and ready to just conquer the world kind of thing. But sure, physically you're tired. You don't get a lot of sleep. Now, we don't do retreats like that, but I used to go to these retreats where you're lucky if you got four hours sleep and you are beaten down and it's on purpose. Because when are you going to cut your arm off? When are you willing to just abandon everything that you believe? People are very fearful of that. It's, it's, it's a, a difficult point for them. Because if you give up everything you believe, then what's left? Yeah, where are you? Where'd you go? Well, it's an amazing thing. When you can actually give up everything that you believe, give up all the little props that you've used throughout your life to define who you are, when you do that, you're still there. But it's scary because people are worried. They're worried that they'll lose interest in the things they're interested in now. And they will, some of them. You know, you'll lose interest in being petty. You'll lose interest in getting even with people. Boy, there is a waste of time.